So I'm very happy this evening to introduce our speaker, Melina Senthil Watts, who will be reading from her novel, Tree. Um, Melina's writing appears in Earth Island Journal, Sierra Magazine, uh, the New York Times Motherload blog, and other local venues. Um, this fall, Tree was a centerpiece at a show at the Museum of Ventura County. And she currently serves as the watershed coordinator for Los Angeles. Um, sorry, I'm having a little bit of trouble. <laughs> my Zoom is in the way of my reading um, for Los Angeles County. And she's worked in conservation in California for over a decade. Um, so we're very happy to have her reading from her novel, Tree. I'm really looking forward to this. And Melina, uh, feel free to do more of an introduction or if you want to talk about um, if we buy Tree during this presentation. And I know you also are going to be putting some other things into the chat. So um, if everyone can just mute themselves and uh, I hand it over to you, Melina. Well, first of all, I wanna thank all of you for inviting me to be a part of your group tonight. Um, I've always admired um, the California Native Plant Society. I love native plants and you know, the work that you do to spread knowledge and the joy of native plants is, I can't overstate how much it means to me. So it's its a big honor to be here. Um, <clears throat> so I would like to share with you, uh, uh, I wrote a novel called Tree and uh, here's a look at the cover. I don't know if you can see it. Um, and Tree is a story of 229 years and a life history of a California live oak from the point of view of the tree. So the tree is the narrator. If you find this intriguing and you enjoy this event this evening, at any point over the next month, if you want to order books from um, uh, the publisher, which is called Change the World Books. So if you scroll up, you can see changetheworld-books.com is the website. All you have to do is put CNPS before your first name when you make the order. And if I see CNPS, half of whatever you spend uh, purchasing books will go directly back to your chapter of CNPS. So hopefully that will help you guys um, with whatever you need for your organization as well. So um, I wanna talk about why I wrote the book a little bit before I read from it, because I think that's generally something people are interested in. Um, the, the first reason is of course, I love native plants. And I recognize that if you care about biodiversity, that native plants are the foundation of any ecosystem that you have. And I wanted to make an emotional story that connected people to the ecosystem that I grew up in, in the Santa Monica Mountains, in a way that let people feel sort of my intense feelings about these plants that I felt like the plants were emoting at me and I was emoting back at them. So I had this experience when I was at UC San Diego, which kind of drove the writing of the book, which I'll come back to if you want. Um, but I wanna also share with you that I'm, I'm very interested in ecological history. And uh, ecological history is the concept that whatever human society one belongs to, there are cultural values embedded in that human society that that uh, either support or, or change uh, ecosystem function radically. So some of the examples that come to mind immediately when you think about the history of native plants in Southern California and in, in Central California, throughout California, when the Spanish first came to California, it, it, I'm, I'm talking conquistadors, before they were even settling, when they were just exploring, they brought with them cattle and sheep and goats and pigs. And, and uh, at the meantime, all the First Nations peoples in Central California and Southern California, the primary food source for their communities one way or another was acorns. And as you know, acorns are a superior food source compared to like wheat or, or corn or rice or other other you know grains that were that we think of as the backbone of civilization because they're higher in fat and they're high in protein. So when the Spanish were traveling and they had these pigs, the pigs got loose and pig's favorite food is acorns. 
So the pigs cleared out the acorn crop. So when you look at that big transition from uh, ranchero culture over to missionary culture, it was in part driven by that one simple act of letting pigs go free. So there's a lot of, of themes like that. Um, as people who care about native plants, one of the things I found super interesting is people can tell you what an ecosystem was like in California with all these different ecosystems, the original version versus what we have now with all these various invasive and introduced plants, right? Mm -hmm. The one area where we know the least about is native grasslands. And they seem to have been invaded most thoroughly. So when you try to go back and look at native grasslands, how can you figure out what they were? So there's a number of botanists who are historical ecologists who have gone back and they've looked at the, um, uh, the adobe bricks of the original missions, like basically the oldest Western style buildings on the landscape in New Mexico, Arizona, California. And when they pick apart the dust and they look at the pollen and they look at the seed types in the adobe brick, they're finding it's already like 98% introduced plants. So what these scientists have posited is that actually before the conquistadors even landed, just from the boats, just from the grains and, and detritus from the horse's hooves that was on the surface of the boat that got picked up by birds and brought and dropped and that that spread that quickly. So these kind of themes kind of work their way into the book of things that are interesting to me. Um, but then there's this whole emotional element of the book of I am trying to think like, what does it feel like to be a tree and how do plants relate to each other? So there was some science that drove that. Of course, I'm very interested in uh, the work of Dr. Suzanne Samard who posits that there's an underground fungal network that trees use to communicate very slowly back and forth. And that there seems to be evidence that trees will actually kind of donate um, water or donate food to trees within their own community. And it's not just their own species, it's other trees. So you have this kind of uh, emotional familial relationship within a forest that's starting to surface from the science. Another scientist who uh, influenced me heavily um, was Sir, Sir Chandragas Bose, and he was a uh, polymath from 19th century India who was interested in botany. He was uh, uh, a leader in physics, and he also wrote science fiction. He was sort of uh, their answer to um, uh, you know, any of the Renaissance characters that we would think of as being you know, brilliant in multiple levels, right? And his studies showed in, in the late 18th, 19th century, early 20th century, that plants were communicating electrically. And that was sort of pushed aside by European scientists as being too sort of mystical. But what's happened is since the, since the 90s, some of his science has been replicated and we are finding that plants do communicate electrically. So that kind of drove some of the, the fun stuff in my book. The last thing that I'll share with you uh, before I launch into actually reading from the book is, you know, why did I write it? So I had this very personal experience. I was uh, a freshman in college. I had gone to UC San Diego and I was feeling really sad. Um, all of my friends had gone to school on the East Coast and I was feeling lonely and I was frankly kind of feeling suicidal. And it was kind of Friday night about this time of year, actually. And I head back to the dorms. And I could see kind of lights sparkling in the different rooms and I could hear music drifting. I could see couples walking by and laughter and I was all alone and I, 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 I couldn't kind of take it. So I just kind of lay down in this field of grass, very generic looking, you know, lawn style grass. And as I lay down in the grass, feeling blue, I felt one of the pieces of grass kind of emote at me and give me caring. And I was so startled. So I kind of emoted back at the grass and said, for lack of a better way of communicating, hello. And then I felt this grass sort of connected two pieces of grass next to it, who also joined the grass and connecting to me. And then it kind of spread throughout the whole field till I felt this whole field of grass kind of buoying me up and connecting me. So that's why I wrote the book. Um, I hope you'll enjoy it. I'm gonna read three different pieces from it. And, um, then I'd love to talk to you about your feelings about trees and plants, because what I always find when I do book readings, especially with plant people, is that our culture is very sympathetic when we talk about human relationships or even relationships with dogs and cats. But we also have deep relationships with plants. And I feel like this is a novel that gives us an opportunity to express that deep connection, our soul connection with, with trees and, and native plants. So the first piece I'm going to read 
Um, when I have read with children in the audience, they're always very interested in how big is tree at any point in the story. So at the very beginning, tree's an acorn. And at this point in the story, tree's uh, under a year old. So it's probably about this tall. And uh, tree's best friend is a Mexican sprangle grass, which as you may know, is a plant that gets to be about three feet tall and is very thin and lacy and delicate and ethereal. I thought it was sort of the opposite of a tree in terms of like, you know, uh, substance and depth. And it's an annual. And uh, the name of this Mexican uh, sprangle grass is univervia. And at this point, univervia is taller than tree. So they are coexisting. And uh, there is another uh, grass, a young deer grass named Dant, who has been trying to push uh, uh, Univervia's roots aside. So there's been conflict in the field, if you will. Um, and I just lost my place, so bear with me. Uh, yes, here I am. Okay. While the herd of grass was intensely engaged in this battle, wondering if Dant would do such a heinous thing to a sibling blade that everyone, but everyone knew Dant had loved so much. A second herd of deer was on the hoof, wandering through the meadow. The grass had known the prickly unease of deer before. Their hooves severed the top portions of grass off and crushed young and old plants, causing the need to grow back over a week's time. And they ate the tops of plants and sometimes they uprooted grass and that was just that. The deer were blandly violent, oblivious to that which they caused. A velvety brown mouth came near the patch of grass, which included Dent, Vicium, and Univervia. A big bite took out Dent and Dent's pack of friends, severing them off at an inch above the roots. There was a universal shriek as a creature began grinding them down into food and the silence of a noble death thereafter. Dant, suffering a mortal wound, clung to the earth by his roots, shivering at the disappearance of 90% of his stem and blades. Univervia spoke softly. Dant, you are still alive. Don't fall asleep. Don't give up. Grow. Grow. You can heal and thrive. Shocked to the core by kindness from Univervia, after having put he under a grass fatwa, Dant cried. Univervia continued. Grow. Grow. And Dant clung to the command and put out a wish to form cells along the severed edge, oozing precious wetness into the air. Dant began to reconstruct. And in that moment, the deer's mouth came back in and neatly chopped off half of Univervia. Tree was electrified. It felt like his own core had been cleaved. To Tree's surprise, he could still feel the blade of Univervia that was on the deer's tongue. And the feelings that came at tree were fast, intense, and surprising. The whole blade lay languid, surrendering, as a tongue mashed the strands of grass up to the roof of the doe's mouth. Then the deer twisted the grass sideways and ground teeth into the grass. And as the grass was destroyed, each cell popped and gave shots of grass life force into the hungry deer in little pops of ecstatic release. The whole thing happened as swiftly as a string of firecrackers going off into light and smoke, leaving behind a dull residue that gave no sense of the evanescent beauty that had been enchanting the air only moments before. Tree felt this chunk of univervia embrace willful dissolution. And then suddenly, all of these little pieces that had been integrated into univervia were separated into something like Ananda, the joy which powers the universe. And then, then the grass was dear. The joy, which, excuse me, the grass was dear. Tree looked at the deer with newfound respect. On a fundamental level, the animal was grass. The deer itself was plant. Boggled by the insight, Tree could only be still and erect and watch the marauding deer move on. The cry of the half of Univervia, which remained, tore into deer like what tore into tree like watching a lover plunge off a cliff. Tree gasped out as a last stitch effort, Univervia, and Univervia grasped at the context. Am I alive? The shortened grass shrieked. Relieved to have made contact, to have heard a voice, Tree spoke with the majesty of a ground tree, completely silencing the entire bustling through a herd of grass. You are still here and you will grow. That's the first of three pieces. The next piece is uh, the introduction of a character named Maria Marta. Maria Marta is uh, a teenager at this point in the story, and she is the daughter of a ranchero, and the ranchero's family has been hit by cholera. 
So there's been a number of deaths. So she's feeling sad at this point in the story. The priest came and she left. The second funeral was awful. Her father just broke down. Ultimately, he had to be carried out of the cemetery. Everyone, woman and man, identified with his grief and he was nearly drowned by kindness. The little children held his hand and caressed his cheeks. Maria Marta rode her horse in the middle of this entourage and slowed to a stop. The entourage passed her in a slow stream of people, horses, carriages. She pulled aside a little and then rode off the trail. She slipped into a grove of trees and disappeared within 10 yards. The quiet eased her. So many voices, so many hearts, too much. She let her horse have her head and the mayor picked the way. They wandered through trees and across a long valley. The mayor picked up the pace and the girl let her go into the ground eating lope that cowboys use for travel. When they hit the foothills, she let her pick her way up and she found they were in Topanga. The mayor found the headwaters of the old Topanga Creek and they crossed the confluence of Topanga Creek, meandering back north. She went up through some tree spiked grazing lands and down into another watershed where they came across a still valley with a huge California live oak standing in the middle by itself. Tired with her jaunt, the mare stopped to graze and the girl slipped off, landing on the soft dry grass, which crunched like the papers with face powder her mother used to get from Spain when she walked across them. The shade of the tree was inviting in the heat of the day. She stretched out on the cool damp ground before the tree. Full length and, um, and cool at last, she loosened her bodice so that she could breathe. Privately, she realized she was supposed to be crying her eyes out in public with family and friends or crying her eyes out here all by herself, but she felt nothing. The more she tried to drum up sentiment by remembering her mother, her brother, her sisters, the more she could not feel. Even her memories stalled out. She could not seem to remember anything much. She lay still in the grass and finally fell asleep. Tree noticed the human stretched out on crunchy leaves over his roots. He observed she was female, more of a sapling than a tree, and appeared to be dormant. Maria Marta's grief drained into the ground as she slept, and Tree's roots caught a dissolved portion of it, enough to stop photosynthesizing and listen. Inside her core was a, black, uh, a blackness like uh, some harrowing astronomical conceit, black, airless, featureless, bleak. It was the truest thing in all the meadow and surrounding hills. Tree felt a bit tender of this human because it was the first time he had identified a big feeling coming off a human, confirming his suspicion that perhaps animals were not so different from plants after all. She lay as if she might not wake again and not moving and barely breathing. More and more of her feelings from the funeral crept into tree, radiating off her skin like heat from a rock uh, of being captured by his leaves and lowest branches. The afternoon wore on and as the sun began to cozy up to the Western Hills, a chill breeze slid out the onto the meadow over the meadow, uh, raising tiny hairs on the girl's arms. She shivered, hugging herself without wake waking. Tree felt coldness on the tips of his bark and a feeling like new leaves being pulled off his branches odd. From the creek, the new crop of Pacific tree frogs, more or less the size of Ariel, started to uh, in on the 10th chorus of the day in little uh, two so little couplets. Tree heard them and so did the girl for her eyes glinted open at the sound and Tree saw the underside of a California live oak through a meadow of minuscule black lines dry branches and deep green leaves. A gall or two, a squirrel zipping around, a branch out of sight, was it himself? The girl sat up and looked towards the creek uh, where, the, um, where the noises were coming from and Tree felt a crush of emptiness in his core and realized it was her core, not ease, her loss, not ease. Some little sprout had loved those frogs and now their exuberant noise was pulling her to pieces while she sat still. He felt the prickle of dead leaves through his roots. Ease dead leaves her legs, Tree guessed. Her, um, her, I'm so sorry. Um, her unspoken shout for her brother's death played loud in his core. Tree went into himself and collected the care he had received from 50,000 days of hot light, affection from a rock, patience, faith, hope. 
In tree, let this accrued warmth come up into his trunk and out into his curving branches and down his gnarled roots. There is so much in E, so much to give and to share. The girl's eyes popped open, startled. She turned to look at Tree and E knew the hot light was in her now. Her dark eyes slowly filled up like the trout pool in the dry creek bed during an unseasonable drizzle. Uh, tree, poured out, um, tree poured out of his core into this flesh and red creature, this animal who walked and talked and ate and shot. She took the light like a sea ticking in water. While Tree gave light to her, her eyes leaked water, surely a strange thing to do in such a dry world. She reached and put her hands onto Tree's old trunk, and from her hands, Tree felt light coming back at itself, something small and fragile, but as unctuous as spring. She pressed her lips onto his bark, and Tree could not help but recoil. She felt it and pulled back. She spoke, No quiero comerte, solo quiero di gar gar di 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 uh, sorry, solo solo quiero dar gracias a mi amigo. Tree understood her as easily as una vervia and looked into his core for words that a human could understand. There was a long gap. Tree felt stultifying. A space came up between them, as if impossible as it might seem, he were moving away from her. He rushed to connect again. Ah, uh, said Tree, struggling to move forward into a common language. Maria Martha leaned in close, embracing Tree as once she had her kin. You don't have to talk, Maria Martha thought, slipping into the middle ground between them. I hear your feelings. You have given me kindness and love. And this, she gave back Tree a serving of what he had passed unto her. This is light, she asked. Luz, Tree agreed. Once again, Tree could feel uh, the best within his core, moving into the core of this young human. He could not help it. He wanted to give her anything, everything to drown her grief in the largeness of his own life. It was too much for any one person to take on. Yet Maria Martha held on to Tree. Don't leave me. Maria Martha said in a silent space of two, please don't leave me. Tree answered truthfully, not knowing how to lie. I will try to stay. So the last piece is very short and it's in honor of the drought. And at this point, Tree is just a sprout, has five leaves and is feeling like Tree may not survive because there has been no rain in so long. So I will close out with this last page. As the days crept on, Tree gradually stopped growing and started enduring and eventually shriveling a little, even drooping. There was no more water to provide the tension needed to keep a small young plant upright. Tree's love for the hot light was unabated, but Tree's appreciation for nighttime grew. Nighttime was cool, dew fell. It was relaxing after enduring dehydration to at least feel better for some hours. But the moisture below was so very far away. How could Tree get moisture? Where was water? Where did it come from? Tree yearned inarticulate and passionate for a solution to all of this. And then the Santa Ana canis, and then the Santa Anas came, and Tree was flattened by these wild winds of fall, late fall that seemed to double the heat and to elicit all sorts of crazy yearnings in the animals that traversed the hillsides. Tree felt it too, that sense that magic could happen, that the future was just around the next instant, that if you wanted it enough, it would be yours if only you wanted it enough, whatever it was. The winds poured on and on. For an hour, the little oak spurt was bent nearly to the ground. Sometimes it withstood the onslaught, um, bending only a little. Two days worth of desiccating welter and tumult, and then a stillness. The heat deepened. Tree could feel tree's very life. Already Tree had known beauty and love and fear and sorrow, and now it was coming to an end. The next night was cool. And in the morning, yesterday's turquoisey sky was now completely gray and cool drops plopped down onto the earth first slowly and then more swiftly. And Tree uncurled, reaching up for the wet in triumph and vigor, just as Tree had first uncoiled to hit the hot light full on. When drops fell on Tree, Tree's thin bark and leaves, now two more now, sucked them down in pure. And as the gr ground grew soft and then liquid, Tree's root puffed up like the tummy of a pregnant bunny, fat and white and full of good things. The little tendrils snaked down and around, embracing their portion of earth ever more deeply. From the center of Tree's core, Tree cried out to the universe, life is good. 
and the rain came down like laughter. So that is my serving of my novel for you guys this evening. And I would love to connect with you if you have any questions about the book or the writing of the book, or best of all, if you have a favorite tree story you would like to share tonight, I would love to hear about your tree. Madeline, what's your question? Um, if everybody wants to turn on their videos um, and their... Um... Oh, I didn't have a question. I was just giving you applause. Thank you for thanking you for the reading. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I'll give you guys a secret. Next time, if you have an author and you turn on your screens, it reduces stage fright when I can see your faces. Because <laughs> then I can see if you like it or not. Otherwise, I'm reading it. I'm like, oh, I hope it's working. <laughs> Oh, sorry. We no, 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 no. I should have said something. But then it's just a funny, it's a funny little quirk. And maybe it's just me. Maybe other people don't care, but I, I like seeing you guys. So Thank Christy you. has a question. Sorry, when I was late. It's great to see you. I have kind of two questions, but number one, could you just tell us in case we missed it where we can buy the book? Yes, if you scroll over um, on the um, on the side, you could see the change the world books.com. That's the publishing house. And the publishing house will take half of your purchase price and donate it back to your chapter of CNPS. Oh, wonderful. That's so the way to do that, you guys, you have to put CNPS and then Jane Smith or John Smith so that I know it's coming from you and then I'll donate. We'll make I'll make sure they donate it back. If you if you buy it from Amazon um, or Timber Books in in Ventura, the money goes to them. But if you buy it from the publishing house, they want to support your your mission. Wonderful. And then the second part is if you talked about this already, could you just give us a little slice into what inspired you and like what other kinds of groups are responding, you know, to the message? Like, because it's applicable to multiple groups, not just, you know, conservation groups, but like, how did you come up with this idea? Well, to be totally honest, um, at the time I had my least favorite job of my career, I was working for an insurance firm and the people were nice, but I found it boring. It wasn't a good fit for the things I'm good at, if you know what I mean. And so I worked for the senior VP who was brilliant, but a bit of a screamer, and he had had, he, well, bless his heart, right? I mean, he couldn't help it. So I didn't blame him, but um, he had gone off to uh, a fancy dinner, a lunch, a lunch in Beverly Hills on a Friday with new clients. And I knew that meant he was buying the most expensive wine on the menu. And I was not going to see until Monday. So I had to sit at my desk with no work until five o'clock, which is a long stretch in a cubicle. You know what I'm saying? So I'm sitting there and all of a sudden out of the blue, I have this strong connection to this redwood tree that I had met when I was 13. And it was like talking to me from 400 miles away saying, I'm still here, do you remember me? And I was like, of course, but I'm honored that you showed up. Like, what else do you say, right? And it said, write about me, write a novel about me. And I said, you're a 2000 year old tree. You're too big for me, I can't. And it disappeared. And immediately the moment that it disappeared, a California live oak showed up and said, I've been waiting for you your whole life. I knew you were going to come. I'm here. So then I was like, well, okay. And then the entire story like popped in my head in about 90 seconds. It was the most euphoric and electrifying gift of like, oh, well, of course it's going to start off in you know, the early Spanish period and go through the Shumash and the, the cowboys and end up with Hollywood new money, right? And so the first third of the book wrote itself like just a, coming out of me like, like a dam breaking. Do you know what I mean? It was just amazing. And then at a certain point, I went, oh my God, I've got to do homework. So there was a multiple year effort of like learning about how oaks procreate and grow learning about um, theories about scientific plant communication um, lots and lots and lots of California history. So I don't know if any of you guys are history buffs, but Dr. Kevin Starr did the book blurb on the back. And that for me was like, it was like getting an Academy Award. I couldn't believe it. I was so honored because I read a lot of his books to do the research, right? And um, so again, I don't know if other people in this group are writing, but I found 
I got about halfway through writing it, maybe two thirds. And then I had like different pieces that I was personally finding hard and I had kids and I had a new career in the environment and I was overwhelmed. And I'm like, how am I ever going to do this? So I was really blessed. I knew this really crotchety old billionaire in Malibu named Ozzy Silda, who was my friend and he supported my work as a watershed coordinator in part. So I would always have coffee with him when I saw him. So I met coffee. I met him for coffee one morning and he looks at me and he goes, so Melina, let's talk about you. If you could do anything in the world, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I have this book and I think it was why I was put here on this earth and I haven't finished it and I'm such a loser and I can't, you know, and he goes, well, what would it take to finish it? And I said, it would take two to three months of time of not working. He goes, well, how much money do you need? I go, well, $10,000. He goes, that's ridiculous. How about six? So he gave me enough money to stop working and finish the book. And I'm so grateful. It, it was, and he's dead now because he told me I could never, ever tell anyone that he did this wonderful thing for me. So I never did. But now that he's left our, our world, I can thank him <laughs> because I, I want his spirit to know that I'm uh, enjoying it still. So that's how I wrote it. And, and the other thing, which since you asked a question of where is this book going, um, I've done talks uh, all the way from San Diego up to Arcata. Um, and uh, it's sometimes like, you know, California Association of Resource Conservation Districts or Chico, Cal State uh, Chico has a beautiful regenerative agriculture program where I spoke um, and lots of, you know, book talks and literary people, um, some high school talks and um you know very diverse and and the thing that i find over and over again is at least one person in the audience is like oh that story about the grass that happened to me you know and i thought i was such a freak with my grass story that i didn't tell that to anybody for decades and now i have people telling me all the time oh that's me so i feel like i become this conduit for people to admit that their deep interconnectivity with plants right and i think that if we want to sustain biodiversity, I've come to realize from talking to audiences and hearing what people said to me about how they feel about the book, I thought I was writing about a tree and other people were saying, no, Melina, you are writing about an ecosystem and you're writing about everybody. You love that rock as much as you love that tree and you love that grass as much as you love that, you know, mountain lion, you love it all. And I think that if we're going to sustain biodiversity, opening our hearts to the idea that are interrelated with every living being, we're, we're more closely related to a tree than we are the moon, right? And if we feel that it, and we make that our priority of like loving all of our family, our extended family, I think it will change how we vote and how we do business and how we live. And we might have a shot at sustaining what's left of biodiversity. So that was, that was a long answer to your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Any other questions for Melina or comments? I, I would love to hear from you guys if you have a favorite tree that like put you on the plant path or if you have a plant that put you on the plant path because sometimes people have interesting stories about how they became... Uh, an advocate for California national plants. I'll go. <laughs> I just, I grew up um, hiking with my parents who were Sierra Clubbers and Native Plant Society people. And my dad was a docent, hike docent. And um, yeah, that's just kind of, I grew up amongst redwoods and duckers. So up in Northern California. And, Redwoods are amazing. Yeah. And I just got back from Canada where I saw the one of the largest duck firs I've ever seen. It was over 200 feet tall. It was 800 years old. So, Unbelievable. They, yeah, it's very special. <laughs> it was fun to see, to be in a rainforest compared to here. Oh. Just, um, I felt like a different, I was on a different planet. It was, it was great. Highly recommend it. <laughs> Super powerful. Yeah. Do any of you others have plant stories to share? So I do. During the first part of the COVID 
COVID shutdown. My name's Leslie Purcell, by the way. Um, I stayed down in LA, Culver City area, in a little studio cottage behind my friend's house. But it was a really, really nice neighborhood to walk in. So I could walk and get out and walk. And nearby up the street, a few houses was this wonderful, it was like, I think a black stage and it was huge and it smelled so good and the flowers and the bees loved it and I loved it. And I used to hang out with that stage and smell it and relate to it. And it just made me feel so much better. Every, every time I went out and walked, I would go by the stage and say hello and hang out. And eventually I met the woman whose house it was in front of. And so that was nice too. And I told her <laughs> how much that plant meant to me. So that that's my sage story. <laughs> so here's an interesting insight about the scent of the sage. And, and have you guys, mm -hmm. are you familiar with that writer, Peter Wallabine, who wrote um, The Inner Life of Trees? He, he talks about how um, for example, uh, in, in the, there's a place where there's giraffes grazing and I think it's an acacia tree and they eat the part of the tree and it gives off a pheromone that tells the other trees to release toxin in their leaves so they won't taste good to, to the giraffe. So it's protecting them by this communication with plant pheromones, which by the way, for us, we experience as scent. So I love the idea that the sense of plants are a form of communication like music is or something. Um, so maybe the sage was talking to you in a way with, with its delightful scent and, and you know, giving you that gift of connection. So, um, so I have a couple of invitations to related events that you might wanna join me with, I don't know. Um, I'm doing a tour of the Santa with the Santa Barbara Creeks Division on Friday, um, meeting up at uh, 945 and then from 10 to 12 we'll be walking around looking at sites near the beach where they've done creek and wetlands restoration. Then we'll have lunch and then they're going to take us to other sites from one to three and of course native plants are integral to their work. So if you want to join the event bright below the Change the World books is for that invitation is an invitation for that if you would like to join me. Um, above the Change the World books is an article I wrote, a, an interview I did with Erica Guys, who wrote Water Always Wins, and she'll be doing a keynote speech at an event I'm doing on Thursday, November 17th, which may be of interest. Um, I want to share one more plant story with you before I go, which is when I was in Sacramento, um, one of my girlfriends up there is Jewish and they have a Jewish New Year of the Trees, which I hadn't realized. They have four annual New Year's every year. So she invited me up to speak to her community um, at her congregation, to, her rabbi actually invited me at the New Year of the Trees. And I, I gave my talk and one of the people in the room was actually a Holocaust survivor who had lost every living relative and the entire congregation in Sacramento had taken her on as everybody's favorite you know, honorary relative. She was very beloved. So she was the first person to raise her hand when I said, do you have a tree story? And her story was that after she left Germany, and of course we all knew what that meant, she went to a kibbutz in Israel. And when she got to the desert, there was what looked like a dead apricot tree. And she turned to the other people who had traveled with her, who had all equally tragic stories. And they said, you know what? We're not gonna let this tree die. So they went to a library, they did research, they hand watered it, they talked to it, they prayed over it. And it burst into leaf and it burst into flower. And within two years, it was this incredibly, fec fe how do you say that word? Fecund, fecund, prolific fruit bearing tree. So um, she told this beautiful story of like saving a tree of life for her, right? In, in Israel, I literally cannot even taste an apricot or apricot jam without thinking of her. So please know that, you know, your stories and your relationships with plants are so powerful when we share them with each other it builds it builds our network of tree lovers so i see so, some, teresa is telling a fun story i love that thank you for sharing that teresa it's in the chat it's in the mm -hmm. chat yeah did you want to tell us about it teresa 
She might not be able to. Sometimes, sometimes Zoom is weird that way. Um, yes. So uh, Teresa is Terry, and sorry, she's Terry. our new membership coordinator, which we're very grateful for. Um, yeah, so she put in the chat, uh, Chris and I have an oak seedling in our Ventura yard that volunteered in a pot in his yard in Fillmore. And we dream about its 200 year life and we hope its future is bright. That is so sweet, Terry. Thank you. Well, again, you know, thank you all for including me. I appreciate you taking the time to connect with me this evening. Can, thank you can so you, much. you tell us? Can you tell us the link again if we're interested um, in checking out the event on Friday? It's in the chat, well. Leslie. Um, so if you go to the okay. bottom of your Zoom and you click on chat, the um, sidebar for the chat will come up. And so um, the event is- um, I'm gonna drop it in the bottom to make it easy. Here's the Santa Barbara event. Okay, So Great. thank you. We'd love to have you come. And the people that do the work at Santa Barbara Creeks Division, they have two to $3 million a year and they have for 20 years. And the reason that Santa Barbara is significantly more beautiful than many other urban cities of similar size, I think, is Santa Barbara Creeks Division. Uh, I'll also add, uh, if you want to save the chat with all the various links, if you click on chat, chat and in the lower right-hand corner, there's three little dots. If you click on those three little dots, you can see an option to save the chat. Then when the Zoom is over, you'll find that there's a file saved for you with all those links that we've been discussing. You're a genius. I can't believe I've been doing Zoom all these years and I didn't know that. I've been cutting and pasting as I go all these years. <laughs> Pat is our Zoom. I used to. I used to do the same thing until fairly recently. I'm, I'm so happy to learn from my betters. And this presentation will be on our YouTube channel, which is accessible um, on our website, right? Carolyn? Yes, yes it is. Under resources, I can grab that. If, if you wanna direct anybody to it, so. Fantastic. Well. Thank you for all that you do for native plants. Thank you for including me. And maybe I'll see some of you on Friday. Make sure to say hi and, um, you know, hug a tree. All right. Well, let's give Melina a Yay. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. It was, it was delightful. Very, very Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, everybody have a great evening. Hey, good show.